Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Off The Fence, brought to you in association with Boyle Sports. This is your weekly go-to jumps programme, but you already know that by now because so many of you will have been with us from the very start of the season. And of course, we've been building up to the Cheltenham Festival all season long, and now we're only a couple of weeks away. So excitement is sky high. And as always, I ask you to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel so that you don't miss a single episode of Off The Fence going forwards. And typically, I am joined by the usual gang of Tony Keenan and Barry Geraghty. Uh, let's do a quick check in with the boys before we get stuck into the show. Barry, how are you? Very good, Vanessa. Yep, all very good. Looking forward to two weeks' time. Brilliant, yes, as am I. Uh, Tony, how are you getting on over there? We've been racing this week. I was going to say that I'm good, but that would be a lie. Um, oh. I think I've bagged four or maybe five horses I've beaten in a photo in the last two days. So, um, Patrick Mullins won in the last at Nace, just put the tin hat and it all together. Um, I don't know, he was prickly at fault, though. He just the looking between the legs thing just, just annoyed me a little bit. I think it was more the horse, but anyway, um, not, not to worry. We'll try again, try and get it back this week. Oh, okay. Well, I love your honesty. That's what we're here for on this show. So we appreciate that. Um, let's kick off with a look at, back at what happened where over the last seven days. And we're going to rewind right back to Thursday and take a look at the Quivega Mares hurdle where we were all looking forward to seeing Brandy Love. But he, she was pretty disappointing and she was overshadowed by the winner, Queen's Brook, um, who was pretty impressive on the day, Tony. What did you make of that performance and where does that put her now in relation to the Mayor's Hurdle at Cheltenham? A good performance out of Queensbrook. I thought Jordan Gainford was good and proactive on her. Um, she does seem to like Punchestown a bit. Whether she'd be good enough in a Mayor's Hurdle now would be questionable. I think Mary's Rock has kicked on a little bit since that um, defeat of Queensbrook last year. As to Brandy Love, I thought it was okay, although it would be okay, I think, if, if she'd run this kind of race in November or December and she was building up through the season. But the fact that such a quick turnaround is a little bit of a worry for me. I know at, at the weights and measures and that, she had her grade one penalty. She comes out at it quite well, or may, maybe the best mare in the field or damn close to it. But it just her finishing effort wasn't brilliant. Like she had three runs last year where she put up three really, really good performances. She actually bolted up in the maiden at Nace. Um, she was second at Fairy House despite doing absolutely everything wrong. And the mare that beat her is a very good mare as we've seen this season. And then this absolutely brilliant performance last Easter. And I think compared to those, um, this effort was a little bit flat. She's drifted out to what um, seven or eight the one now for the mare's hurdle. The price is kind of okay. Um, I'm kind of leaning towards her stable mate at the moment, Echoes and Rain, especially with maybe the ground not been too bad, um, might help, I suppose, make it that she won't, her stamina won't be hugely tested, hopefully. But no, it was a neutral enough run, but the timing is a little bit off putting. Okay, yeah, we can confirm Brandy Love is currently 6-1 to one with ball sports for the Mayor's Hurdle and Queensbrook is 9s, Barry. Um, do you concur what Tony said there that, you know, sort of hard to really get the positives out of the Brandy Love performance when you look back at what she's done previously? I'm not sure. Um, like, Willie felt the need, really felt the need to run her um, and he knew going there that it's obviously the wrong way around for her. Had she have been going left-handed, I think she would have beaten Queensbrook, and we'd all be happy maybe with the run. Um, she she looks a strong filly and probably one that needed to get out and get a run um, and probably no harm to get her jumping as well. Um, she jumped okay through the race with the exception of going a little bit left. Her jumping wasn't bad, um, but she did miss the last, and for me that would have cost her. Um, but I think the fact that Willie felt he needed to run her was an indication that he that's where he wanted to go. Um, she is the only filly to beat, uh, or she's only one only horse to beat Love Envoy, um, who is a very good mare, and she beat her well at Fairy House. Um, she's two from four over hurdles, having been beaten here by Queensbrook, and as Tony mentioned, by Allegory Devassi. So she has a good level of form, and both of those defeats came on tracks going right handed rather than left handed, which would be a preference. So I'd be slow to um to doubt her, and I think you know this is going to be a team. For the for the evening, if you like, is trainers running horses now this close to Cheltenham? Um, you know, there's an element of risk involved, or is it like it's a calculated risk too? And I think Willie has has for me, 
he's rolling the dice that he needed to get her out and he knows where he wants to get her for Cheltenham for two weeks time so I'd be I'd be betting on Willie here and I, I wouldn't be surprised to see her put up a big show Okay, six to one, as I said, with Ball Sports Brandy Love. Uh, let's move on to the juveniles. Barry, we'll kick off with you here because in the Adonis at Kempton, we saw Nuzrek come over and beat Perseus Way in the finish there. Um, I guess, how does this stack up in terms of looking at the triumph or the Boodles picture? Were you taken with Nuzrek? Well, I'd imagine you would be looking at the Boodles picture. Uh, Nuzrek was a good winner. Um, I thought he gave him a beautiful ride there, Jacob. Tactics were right. They dropped in, they crept delivered a nice challenge and won well uh, Perseus Way I think was the unlucky horse in the race he was nearly brought down at the third last a bad mistake at the second last and a bad mistake at the last and wasn't beaten far um, likewise the point I was making just earlier about Brandy Love how will Perseus Way come out of this it was his fifth run over hurdles so he has been busy um, can he bounce back in the short enough turnaround to the Boodles the Boodles have been on the Tuesday so it's a race coming early in the week rather than later in the week so um that's the question mark and off his mark of one two five that wouldn't be a bad run um as i say unlucky but um would have a chance in the boodles i'd say knows i thought had the run of the race and i'd, I'd fancy uh percy's way to turn his tables oh okay interesting uh tony what what do off the back of this how are you looking at the juvenile sort of landscape as a whole because obviously most people are jumping on to the fact that you can't really get away from the fact that the uk juveniles look like a pretty pretty poor bunch at the moment you would have to think so uh, i think joseph o'brien and, and the race planning team there deserve a lot of credit for what they've done uh, to this point in the season they've won the, the three most valuable juvenile hurdles uh, run in england this season um, it, it's not so much that they've won them so that the finale was 29,000 to the winner the finesse was 45,000 and, and the race the weekend was another 45,000 but as it's not it's not so much that they've won them it's the horses they've won them with like comfort zone is probably fourth best juvenile hurdler in Ireland maybe the fifth um, if we're taking a strong view on the JP McManus horse that won a fairy house on Saturday and Nazareth is I don't know the tent best juvenile yeah. holder in Ireland is he top 10 I don't know um, but as Barry said he was probably a little bit fortuitous there at the weekend but that's that's just excellent placing and it does tell you they, they probably knew that those two horses they tried to in a in a good race at Leperstown at Christmas and Comfort um, zone sorry uh, uh, Comfort zone in the Ferry House race uh, in December and, and I suppose they found out that they were a little bit below but placed them well to win these very valuable races yeah, it's intriguing when you when you put it like that and point the facts out. It is pretty impressive from them. Continues Joseph's good run of form over here in the UK. Um, Barry, let's just have a quick word on the Pendle chase. Obviously, we saw Solo win that for an umpteenth time for the Paul Nichols operation, but it was the horses that finished behind him that caught your eye. Yeah, I thought it was a strong race. Um, Solo was a good winner. His first run back after a wind up, jump really well good solid performance uh, I thought that's right Gino ran really well in second missed the third last and was staying on all the way so he's in the plate he's definitely one with a chance but likewise has to bounce back from this um, but I thought Boothill ran well in third and he would for me would have held up the form really well so I think uh, that's right Gino is of interest on the back of this run okay one to take away from that. And Barry, we'll just stick with you for a quick nod towards Christian Williams winning the Ida chase for a second year on the bounce. This time around with Kitty's Light went off a very short price favourite in the end for what is such a competitive race. Yeah, great performance. Um, well picked out. It probably wasn't the strongest renewal ever. Um, but Kitty's Rock was a good winner. Stayed really well. Has the option of the Midlands National or the Scottish National, which she was second in last year. But another brilliant performance from, from Christian. Captain Order won last time in Ascot. He won the, the Coral tro Trophy or whatever was known as the, the the old racing post. He won that last year and Kitty's Light was second. So he's doing really well, especially in these stay in handicaps. Um, but it was definitely it was a race well picked out. She was down in the handicap, I think £10 from what she lined up in the Scottish National. So she was well in. Um, but uh, I think the runner up probably would have preferred softer ground. So it mightn't just have been the strongest race in the world. OK. And Tony, let's head back over to Ireland and take a look at the Bobby Joe chase. I saw Kenboy back in, his, back in the winner's enclosure, something that I genuinely would have had a strong bet on not seeing anytime soon. I, I didn't expect that he... I thought his winning days might be past him, put it that way. 
I think it was um had he won one race since 2019 or um I think that or had he won since 2019 no it was a it was a look like past the sell by date but no job done um falling the race wouldn't look up to much between horses falling horses jumping poorly some of them not handling the ground though and um big price horse uh, finishing in the frame there now where I went who to be quite honest, didn't want to go by between the, the final two fences as much as anything. But I think with all that, you'd have to give um, Vanny as a, a grand national eye catcher here. I thought this was actually a really good run out of him. Um, he might be a horse that's been brought along with that race in mind all season. He had a hefty penalty for winning a very ordinary race in Punchestown as an obvious chaser, um, to be fair to him. He was well backed at the Dublin Racing Festival in the first time cheek pieces, but he, he, he fell quite early in the race, but jumped better than he often has here and you know wasn't really put into the race until quite late then he got a little bit of bother and he had to be switched and didn't really get a hard time late I would say that the Grand National would be just an ideal race for him he'd be loaded with stamina he certainly looked at when he won the Albert Bartlett and yeah it looks like a horse is building into that race rightly I know his, his price is well compressed um, since Saturday but I would say deservedly so Okay, bit of a national shout. And whilst we're on the national topic, Barry, we better just drop in that obviously it was a national weights lunch last week as well. Um, I think the Tuesday that we were recording the show. And was there anything that jumped out the page from the weights lunch that you thought was an attractive, uh, sort of often attractive weight or anything that you thought was kindly treated or that caught your eye, Barry? Yeah, I thought um, Dan Skelton has been targeting uh, races all season. I thought he might be at it again with Lamilos, 10-11. Um, an eight year old five from nine over fences jumps really well very versatile as a guard's going so watered ground if they got rain and it got soft it wouldn't be an issue to him but likewise he was good on good ground so I thought he was of interest um, obviously saved his mark from um, his performance in Newbury he went up six pound for that uh, he beat remaster who went on and won next time in Kempton so the form worked out well it was a good performance as I said jumps really well so I thought he could be of interest okay two national horses put up then by the boys um, let's go back to Ireland and focus in on, again on some of the action over there Tony Bright Hill won at Thurless won the Mayor's Novices listed chase there for the Cromwell team uh, obviously she's been 19 lengths behind Allegor de Vassi in the past and she beat Tell Me Something Girl who went off favourite on the day was this, was this a surprise to you this performance from her? Um, not necessarily a surprise. I think she was building into a, a decent performance and tell me something, girl, and Insti seem unable to jump there, judge on the recent start. But I think it, that was the case with Brides Hill a while back. And you'd have to give Gavin Cromwell an awful lot of credit for how he's brought her along. She started off her, her chasing career quite early in October um, and she was really well backed, I think, if I remember correctly, at Fairy House. Um, and all reports have been that her schooling had went well. But she just, she hit a fence early and she jumped absolutely horrendously one of the worst rounds of jumping you'll ever see um and and and, and didn't complete um and i was in th well that's the end of that you know she, she doesn't look like she's going to make a chaser and then in her next couple of starts the same story jumping poorly out the back um but he persisted with her and i'd say a lot of people just would have given up on her completely and he's got her back jumping she's um been able to drop in and she's always quite a forward going mare over hurdles and they've made a bit of a steer out of her. Now she's won a graded race. So I think absolutely excellent bit of training from Gavin Cromer because I think a lot of people would say, oh, look, we'll go back over hurdles after the early jump in this place. And it does kind of bring in another mayor, um, mayor that's going to Cheltenham, Jeremy's Flame, who, who would have been similarly um, awkward at offences and, and fallen and not completing at her early starts. But again, she looks better than ever this season. She's still throwing the odd mistakes, but her, but her form has taken off. Um, she's finishing out her races really well and she's maybe the experience angle now in the in the mare's chase on the Friday of Chatham. Okay, one one for the improvers. It's not always the sort of ones that get it right first go. Um, Tony, let's stick with you to discuss Corbett's Cross, the sort of uh, mystery that is, who now looks like he's got a right chance in the Albert Bartlett. Um, after his win at the weekend, he took the grade two at Nace, but this was over the minimum trip, the shortest he'd run over in his pretty short career. But uh, the new connections decided to drop him to the two miles, win this, and now he's a short enough price for the Albert Bartlett. I cannot stress how amazing this performance was. Um, <laughs> I, I cannot be more, I could not be any more positive about this horse. Um, found a 50 to me 
you could not write a better race in the calendar for this horse, the, the second. Um, he's free going, he goes in the front, jumps well, um, nays a short of two miles on decent ground, absolutely optimal for this and uh, for this animal. And Corbett's Cross, who's coming off runs at Clonmel on testing ground, Limerick on testing ground and Fairy House on testing ground in the middle of the winter, is able to lay into him, travel with him no problem and jump with him the whole way around and then get the bathroom up the straight. It's an amazing performance out of this horse. Um, no, like, th like, there is no horse in the Albert Bartlett field could do this. I can confidently say that of any of the Irish horses. They'd, they'd be run over in this race. And um, someone might say to you, well, sure, maybe that's exactly the reason why he shouldn't be running in the Albert Bartlett. And, and I wouldn't argue with that. And they were um, talking about maybe supplementing him somewhere else or not going to chat him at all afterwards. But you know what? There's, there's five to one non runner no better but him for the Albert Bartlett at the moment. I backed him yesterday, on Saturday straight after or Sunday straight after the race. Worst case scenario, you're getting your money back. Um, to me, he's a three to one shot at best on the day. Um, I said just the level of ability that he showed here. Now I know he's only won narrowly, but to be able to cope with what, what he's done, dropping down and trip, and we know that he's got bags of stamina. Um, the time was excellent, and look, I know, I know he's going to be backing up quick, but they don't run him unless he's unless he's pleasing them like that. That they, they'll be very good at doing that. So yeah. Five to one to me is, is well wrong at the moment. Can't couldn't it be more positive with this horse? Goodness me, regular watchers of the show will be their jaws will be on the floor, Tony. I don't think I've ever heard you wax so lyrical about a horse. And yes, Corbett's Cross is currently five to one with Ball Sports for the Albert Bartlett. So if what Tony said, if you're a Tony fan, people will be jumping on left, right, and centre, up and down the country, Barry. Have you ever heard Tony speak like that about a horse? I can't say so, Vanessa, but um, <laughs> that's what I've been waiting to see for something in the Albert Bartlett because they've been running around beating each other and not beating each other by far. Um, you're waiting for something to put their head up above the water and say, pick me. So this set has done that. He's put head, shoulders. I think he's standing waist high above everything at this stage. Uh, it was a brilliant performance for all the reasons that Tony mentioned. Um, he's mentioned as well then how he might supplement him for other races and the going is a concern. So whether that comes into play as well with the Albert Bartlett being on the Friday, at that stage, the ground, if it is a dry week, the ground will be at its quickest by Friday. So maybe he'll be supplemented um, for the Ballymore, albeit that's a strong race as well. But maybe they're thinking, considering that as an earlier option for for early in the week but again we're going to talk about someone you know who's going to run a horse this close to Cheltenham but dropped him back to two miles and um, so he wouldn't have as tough a race um, as you would have over further and then just to put in the performance he did I wouldn't think he'd have the, the pace for the supreme on this but it was definitely a brilliant performance um, and the Ballymore would be an option if they wanted to go that way. And you also wanted to flag up same connections with some other high profile targets including the the Moor battle. Yeah, so it was mentioned um, at the weekend how McTighe, uh, who was a grade two winner in Atai back in October, um, could go for the more battle. He's rated 142. Um, he could go there um, to try and collect the 100 gram bonus if he could follow up from winning there to winning at uh, the festival. Now, he would, on ratings, he'd look like the one to beat in the more battle um, off his mark. Um, but he'd have to go to the festival. He'd, have, he'd only have 10 days from there until the Boodles. Um, and 11 days could he go to the Carl which has been mentioned too he's entered in that um, he could wait again then for later in the week he's in, he's in the he's in the county as well I think it is he has a good few entries or he's in the triumph should I say um, so it'll be interesting to see how he fares out in the more battle for starters which I think he should take the beating but to come back from there with a 4 year old on a 10, 11, 12 or 13 day turnaround this will be some bit of training if he can pull it off wow more story to follow in the coming weeks for sure um before we go any further it's competition time everyone check out your qr code right now on the screen uh, scan that on-screen qr code for your chance to win an amazing prize to the cheltenham gold cup via the at the races express and that experience is a really special one you'll have a brilliant day out and you will arrive in style so scan the qr code now and be in with a chance of winning said prize uh we have a few talking points guys and Barry, we're going to kick off with Mary's Rock, who um, Tom Palin from Midland Park Racing has recently um, did an interview where he expressed that they 
I'm kind of keen to go down the stayers route. She's currently a five to one shot for the stayers hurdle. Obviously, people have been debating where she's going to end up, what her target will be at the Cheltenham Festival. Are you inclined to think along Tom's way of thinking that this is the right race for her, the stayers? Well, it's definitely a good option. Uh, the mayor's hurdle does look strong. You have Honeysuckle, uh, Maria's Rock is there, obviously. Um, you have Epitant could come into it. Uh, Brandy Love at the weekend, Love Envoy. So it, it does look a strong race. Or she could go for the, the stairs hurdle, stepping up and trip, obviously, um, and taking on Tia Hupu and Blazing Cal and those. Both equally competitive races, but she gets the seven pound mayor's allowance in the stairs. Um, she put in a good performance in the rail, keel over two and a half on soft ground. Um, where she beat, um, she won in Punchstone, she beat Stormy Ireland last season, and Epitant would have been a little bit flat in third, having been to Cheltenham and Aintree. That was on better ground. I just wonder, on better ground, would she be better up and trip um, at that level? And she definitely, she put in a good performance on soft ground in the rail keel to suggest that getting further would be well up her street. Okay, so you're, you're relatively positive about that decision then if she was to go the stairs route. Um, Barry, let's stick with you because Jack Kennedy obviously had that injury recently to his leg after a fall in Ireland and he's been out for a number of weeks and now he's 50-50 to make the Cheltenham Festival by all accounts. I guess it's it's such a hard time for jockeys at this time of year, but for him coming back, Jack, I mean, he's a laid-back character, we know that already, but what will his mindset be right right now with two weeks to go to the festival do you try and push your body and I guess have you ever been in a similar situation to the one that Jack finds himself in now um well not at the festival I missed the festival once um but I, I couldn't make it but got back for entry so I had a bit of a rush to get back for entry but maybe not as tight as Jack's um so Jack broke his he broke his fibula and tibula um and I remember Ruby in 2018 had a similar fracture and when Album Photo fell in the RSA, he rolled on his leg and it went again. So that's the, the, the risk that Jack takes. But I know a surgeon well for professional reasons as much as anything. And uh, Paddy Kenny is very much, he's black and white. So if he feels Jack is okay, he will be okay. Um, but if not, Jack won't be travelling. So it'll be a yes, no, a quick answer for Jack. But there isn't an awful lot he can do. Only I know he's working in, in uh, the sports in, sports uh, surgery clinic in uh, Santry, working on his fitness and everything. He needs to get back riding out. Um, but it's only when he gets back riding out and you, you start, you know, you're, you're putting weight on that leg from different angles that he might feel the pain. So it'll be interesting. It'll be a very, very quick turnaround if he can make it back. I hope for his sake he can, but... Um, He's definitely he's going to be a close one. And and finally, just on that topic, if we're in a situation where his maybe first ride back is literally the week of the festival, w- would you be in any way concerned about that with someone like Jack, or or will he just jump straight back in where he left off, or is it just different for different people? Probably different for different people, but as you mentioned earlier, Jack is so laid back. Um, you know, he's a brilliant rider. Um very level-headed though so I'd imagine if Jack gets any little bit of practice he won't lack from fitness because I know he'll be on the bicycle and he'll be working hard Um, so he will be fit enough a little bit of match practice but you slot back in and it's a broken leg and he's going to be back within nine weeks that's it's not as if he's been out for six months no quite I mean Incredible turnaround if you can get back and we wish him well on that mission. Um, Tony, last week when we did question time, we had a question in regards to the Gold Cup. So we're going to use that question now um, as a sort of sh- to shoehorn in discussing the Gold Cup. Obviously, we're going to do our big Cheltenham Festival preview show next week ahead of the festival. But we just thought we'd use this time to discuss a little bit of all angles into the Gold Cup. And it was from Grant James Thomas that the question came just in regards to the pace. He was asking... How does the panel feel the Gold Cup will be run? What, what? How do you see it playing out, Tony? Um, difficult to answer this now because it it doesn't look like there's going to be an awful lot of pace. Predicting pace is is something that's difficult, uh, especially in confusion kind of circumstances. This was not an obvious front run. I don't like basing bets on it anyway. Um, I find it better as a post race tool. We can see who's been advantaged and who's been disadvantaged by it. There are some strong stairs, I suppose, in the Gold Cup. Um, Statler would be one. Noble Yates would be another. Um, Statler went forward last time in Leperstown. I don't know that it really suits him. Noble Yates has on occasion at Wexford there, but in the main, he, he'd be dropped in. A high senior is one that would probably want to be prominent, if not going crazy up front, but then he can, he can hit off one. 
Um, Brave Man's game has gone forward in smaller fields in the past, but I can't really see that because he's stepping up in trip. Um, of the rest, maybe one's a bigger price as Capadano has gone forward, and he would have plenty of stamina, as would Hewick. Um, and then, of course, there's always the possibility that connections will just change up things completely um, and just say, no, we're on an outsider, we're going to take a chance and maybe make it a test or try to wait in front. Or, or a jockey can just have a rush of blood to the head. They're, they're, they're not happy with where they're placed after three fences and just decide they're, go they're going to put pace to it. So, no, it's, it's a very confusing pace picture now in the Gold Cup at the moment. Um, very hard to know what way it's going to play out. So, no, sorry, Grant, I'm going around in circles there, I'm not really answering your question. <laughs> we we uh, the show is called off the fence Tony but anyway considering you spend your life off the fence I'll I'll let you off that one um but Barry how what sort of in reaction to what Tony's just said there going through all those horses and not really being able to land on an obvious pace angle if you were riding one of these horses in the Gold Cup is the one that would be an obvious horse to push forward with maybe for the first time in a Gold Cup though. Well, El Dorado Allen made the run in the Denman Chase. He won it last season, and that was the last race he won. But then that's up to Connections. Obviously, he's a big price if Connections decide to go forward and roll the dice, or they could maybe drop in and ride him to run well and hope for the best. But a high senior did line up to make it and did make it early in the Cotswolds Chase. Um, and for me, a front runner, once you have one horse to go forward, you have other horses then who fall along who do need a stronger pace. And like, for example, Tony mentioned Statler would be one, Uick would be another. Um, you would have um, Minarindo as well at this stage. He'd want further. So there's probably plenty of horses there to push a high senior along, albeit it mightn't be a, a blitz, but it definitely, I think, would be a good bit stronger than the pace was a couple of years ago when Albin Photo won it off a slow pace. So I'd say with a high senior there um, and a couple of horses just to help him along and keep him straight and his jumping as well, um, I'd say there would be enough of pace, but you'll need him to go forward. Okay, and do you have a, if you had to pick one horse now, Barry, obviously, as I've said, the real proper Cheltenham Festival preview coming in seven days' time from us, but if I was to pin you down right now, who would you fancy in the Gold Cup? Well, it's easy, fancy Gallop in the Champ, um, and it's a very short price, so there's no point giving you him, but who would be next best, or who's one to give him most to do? Um, Statler, who won the National Chase last year, proved he stayed. Um, I don't think he would have benefited from the lack of pace um, at the Dublin Racing Festival, so obviously stiffer track, better Gallop, going a little bit further, um, likes a bit of nice ground too. I think he could be a horse who might, could be just... Um, the biggest threat to Gallop and the Champ, but um, maybe Gallop and the Champ is his own biggest threat as regards if he stays, he wins. Okay, if he stays, he wins, but Statler and behind roughly around the eight, eight to one shot currently. Um, Tony, let's bring you back in here because, of course, it is now. We are two weeks ahead of the festival, so that means that uh, it is Cheltenham Festival preview nights galore, left, right and centre, up and down both countries. Uh, plenty of preview nights for people to go to if they should so wish. And, of course, they can pick to choose to go to ones that Barry and Tony are at themselves. And, Tony, uh, Tony you've already done one. What were your big takeaways? how was it oh it was it was great crack i have to say god i, mean, I, 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 I think I, like i think this is this is i know this is a new Cheltenham preview night it's up there in south tyrone and dunnock more like, like it's only 40 minutes from my house I, I had never even been on the roads i was on the other night going to this place um lo lovely part of the world and lovely people and my god the enthusiastic lads for racing i, I met one lad at it uh, i think his name was sean mccanny he's bits of horses there with gordon elliott Oh Jesus! Talk about uh, lads with opinions on horse racing. If you think I'm bad, uh, 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 this lad, this lad could talk the head of a spade altogether. But there was a fella. Um, there was a fella sent in a question there last week about what you should listen to and, and what you shouldn't listen to at preview nights. Yeah. And and I suppose what I, what I uh, took from it was I, I tried to listen to maybe connections of horses and they're saying things that are unusual about the horses and maybe negative about horses. Um, because th maybe that wouldn't be the, the norm for people to say so. David Casey w w was a very good listener with some of the, the Mullins horses. Um, with Fasil Vega, he was positive on Fasil Vega, but he also revealed that he was lame for a week after the Dublin Racing Festival with an, and had an overreach, so I, I was taking the negatives from that. On Gaelic Warrior, he did say he's a little job uh, done on his back, w which might help improve his jumping. Um, I thought he was quite negative just on Blue Lord in general, though David Jennings, who was presenting it, was kind of saying David 
just isn't a fan of Blue Lord full stop, which is fair enough, maybe that's come back over the years. And he was also posed the question about how many winners would they have? Um, and he said, he was asked, would you have 10 or more? And he said, no, definitely not under 10 and said they would have very little for handicaps. Um, again, that, that remains to be seen. But the one massive positive that he had, and Barry would be glad to hear this, is he, he was very, very keen on Blood Destiny. It wasn't even a question. Was this was wow. would he would he prefer Blood Destiny over Lost him out? It was all day long. So he's very very strong, which was which was good to hear. Um, Dennis O'Regan on again, lots of very interesting stuff about some of the Gordon Elliott horses. Um, he he was given conflated very little chance to stay in the Gold Cup trip. Uh, on my interpretation of his comments, um, he was absolute debt on American Mike wherever wherever he was running. Um, he thought it was a, a ferocious ne negative that he was declared for a for a Tommy Carberry there at Ferry House on Saturday, which you know, he didn't actually run, but I, I would take his point certainly. And he was very keen on um, imagine for one of the handicaps that he he was going to say he liked them a lot in the autumn. And he strengthened up a lot since, so, so that was quite interesting. And Robert Power was on. Now, I, I was keenly listening to, to, to Robert Power, um, what he taught at Tiupo, having ridden him last year. Now, he, he wasn't concerned about the ground for Tiupo, but Dennis O'Regan, who, who says he rides in plenty of work, said he was a soft ground horse, so I'm not sure we were any further along with that one. We, we'll find <laughs> out on, st on the stairs hurdle day itself. But Robert Power was also quite keen on a horse that I'm somewhat interested in, Magical Zoe. Um, trained by Henry de Bromwich. Obviously, Robert Power is kind of assisting Henry de Bromwich this season. I should sort of say that she was she's been off now since winning impressively in Down Royal in November. Now there is if if you want to read more on that, I think I've got some of the main points there. A good pal of mine was at it that night. Brian Galt. He runs Galtstats.com. It's a very good site for Cheltenham trends and all that type of stuff. Now I know I shouldn't really be praising other people's sites at the races is obviously the, the king, king of king of sites for Cheltenham trends and everything else Cheltenham but Brian do, does decide to raise money for very good causes and I think the Samaritans is his charity this year so if you do get a chance to give it a click a very worthy cause and Brian always looking out for people who are worse off than him. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. And uh, great to hear those insights from those sort of assistant type people in those big yards. I often find that um, that they sort of give away the mo the best insight and some different angles, as Tony has flagged up there. Uh, how many more are you doing, Tony, except ours? Uh, with that one, and I'm doing one with Barry at Navin Racecourse the Saturday before Cheltenham. So um, that, that's quite an early start. That, that It must be a first for a Cheltenham preview. It's actually before midday, I think. Yeah, I like the fact that somebody's put together a Cheltenham preview night or morning or lunch or whatever you want to call it with Barry Geraghty and Tony Keenan, clearly because they're so good on Off the Fence that it's hosted by myself and SRL. But uh, my invite to this preview night must have got lost in the post. Who's hosting it? Does anyone know who's hosting it's it? David Jennings, I think. Oh, I'm oh, not sure who's God hosting it, Barry. Uh, no idea who's hosting it. <laughs> I don't, David I don't know. Jennings. How did it go off you, Vanessa? Can't believe it. Scandalous, scandalous. Anyway, um, right, final final little segment of the show. Let's just have a quick rattle through anything that's caught our eyes in the handicap entries. Obviously, we get the handicap weights this week. Um, Barry, you'll be there on the gravy train watching the weights be revealed at Cheltenham. That's that's a do you must be looking forward to. Yeah, I enjoy a nice lunch these days, Vanessa. So yeah, no, I look forward to that. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see. And I suppose that's probably what, what points me to the horse I'm just going to mention is Run for Oscar, who was third in Haydock on soft ground. He won the Cesar, which on good ground. He's been beaten twice since on soft ground, but he has a mark in England of one four five, So he has that confirmed. Where a lot of the Irish horses are waiting to see how much the English handicapper is going to raise them. So I think that's worth bearing in mind um, is those horses that have a confirmed mark. As I say, he's better form a better ground. He's in the coral hurdle. He would be the one I would be just keeping an eye on at the minute. Okay, run for Oscar in the coral. And Tony, at this stage, handicapping wise, is there anything you'd like to flag up before we get the weights and people start lumping on various horses? Well, as kind of mentioned last week, I won't be going through it until a little bit later, but uh, one of the horses I've had in mind for the coral cup is the very man uh, for a while now. Um, just think he's been running over a trip that it's basically been too far from a number of recent starts. Uh, she had quite well at Dublin Racing Festival. It's dropped down the weights with probably doing very, very little wrong and he won a charity race quite easily there at Punchestown um, weekend before last. So I think he's go going there with a with a decent chance, uh, hopefully with a few duck eggs in front of his name and would probably be a price. I don't think there's any real urgency to back him. At, the, at this point, he doesn't, wouldn't be an obvious 
plunge or he's old or he might apparently look exposed but yeah one for maybe on the day when there's an extra place and things like that and he's drifted a little Okay, the very man for Tony then. And then finally, Barry, um, I joke about you coming over to Cheltenham for the weights lunch, but obviously you will be on track at Cheltenham, and I know you're heavily involved with the track and the team here at, Chel at Cheltenham Racecourse. Um, so you've been back and forth plenty this season, and obviously everyone's hammering home the fact that we've had no rain in the area, but you have been over here plenty. Um, what are you, are you in any way concerned that we could have very good ground during the festival, including on the first first day or, or are they putting plenty of water on well you could have very good ground but you won't have it on the first day it will be water to the slowest of the good um it'll probably be closer to good to soft and good um for the first day but it just depends then from there on so it's easy to focus on the first day's ground if you like um and that's obviously going to be similar ground to the second day but it, it won't get the same level of water overnight as it would have done on the night before and so it when it does get a dry week like this um it will get it will get quicker as the week goes on so thursday and friday's ground could be quicker again but you will definitely have ground closer to good to soft and good for the tuesday Okay, closer to good to soft. We'll hold you to that then. Um, that wraps up the show. Boys, thank you very much as always. Uh, viewers and listeners out there, thank you very much for joining us. This show is our second class show before the Cheltenham Festival and then we will be live during the Cheltenham Festival for all four days, um, reviewing the action and previewing the coming days. But next week, uh, a week after this podcast is coming out, of course, it will be the big Cheltenham Festival preview show for the Off The Fence listeners and viewers. So please do join us for that but in the meantime thank you very much for watching hit subscribe give us a like give us a retweet you know all the drill by now but that was off the fence <laughs>